Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to another Leica conversation. Uh, this is sponsored by um, Leica USA and Tamarkin Camera. My name is Dan Tamarkin. This is our guest, James Dujur, Rice, James Rice uh, who I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But before we do, I want to say a great big thank you to John Kreidler at Leica and Matt Butzow, who's our Midwest Matt, who's our Leica rep. Guys, thank you so much for being here and for all the support, the support with the gear, the support with the tech, everything. We couldn't do it without you. And we're so stoked that you're here. So thanks for, thanks for helping us out. But I'm really just thrilled that my friend James Rice came from Carmel, Indiana, uh, which is near Indianapolis, where, which is where he's based, a civil engineer by trade, um, now retired and a can I say full-time like a shooter? I think you can. Yeah, I think you can. We he's got uh, we got some books and stuff to show you, uh, but Jim uh, has got his cameras here. Full-time like a shooter. Um, this is his fourth book that we'll be talking about this evening, and we'll take a quick glance at some of his other stuff. But um, uh, Jim is a good friend and a great guy to shoot on the street with. He's just a terrific fellow. Very open. Um, and very welcoming and a great Leica shooter and really in every sense of the word and a great friend. Jim, welcome. Thank you so much. Man. I'm so glad it's that you're here. wonderful to be here. It's always great to be in downtown Chicago. It's always awesome to be at the Mark and Camera. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's been uh, the Leica family has become another family for me. Right on. It's just a wonderful thing. Yeah. Right on. Yeah. Well, we first started to hang out together. You know, Jim's bought some Leicas um, from me. So we have a business relationship as well, but we're also good friends. And I really kind of from the moment that we met, um, Jim came into my store and um, uh, here in downtown Chicago and, uh, and we just immediately liked each other and, and started hanging around and shooting and talking Leica. And so I just want to tell you a little bit more about Mr. James Rice. His first book, tell me if I have the order right, right? The first uh, one, uh oh, no, oh see, I already, already, I, I already, I screwed up. So here's the first book that he produced. Um, second look, a lot of these photographs, if not all of them, were made here in Chicago. It's a fabulous monograph printed in black and white. Um, it's really a beautiful book. We're very proud to have it on display here at Tamark and Camera. Um, second look, first book. That's how I'll remember. Yeah. Second look, first book. And then Chicago Avenue, a lot of fabulous photographs and great times we've had along Chicago Avenue. Um, and so this is his second book, also very beautifully printed monograph in black and white, uh, really terrific photographs. It's really just beautiful stuff. Um, and so um, Jim is a mostly a black and white mostly, shooter, right? Mostly, you shoot? but Arthur Meyerson, you know, our good old Arthur, our God love him kind of got me dabbling in color, you know, so I'm still pretty afraid of color, but me too. I'm old enough that I started with black and white film. And so black and white is how I see when I have a camera. Me too. Me too. Yeah. And it's funny, we took a Leica Academy with, um, and if any of you haven't heard of the Leica Academy, please reach out where there's going to be, uh, we have a presentation that we're going to begin in a moment. Um, and there'll be some information there. And if you're curious about Leica Academies, please do uh, take a picture of the link or just give me a call or an email and I'll tell you more about the Academy. But before your most recent book, Real Cuba, we got the pleasure to travel to Cuba we did. together. We, we just did. had a fabulous time. Um, and so Real Cuba is another one of Jim's monographs, um, another beautiful book we're very proud to have on display here um, in our downtown Chicago showroom. And, but tonight we've gathered to talk about Jim's new book, which is really groundbreaking in a lot of different ways. And can I, can you I may. show this baby? You this is another really beautiful monograph. This is our showroom copy. Please ignore the little sticker. Shooting is the name of the book. This is a, a photograph of Jim's mother, Marilyn on the cover. We're going to talk more in a moment. Uh, I want to begin the presentation momentarily and we'll start talking about how this book came to be. And as you may have guessed from some of the information that led to this uh, call, a lot of this book has to do with um, photography and um, uh, friendship and community as a, a venue for healing from trauma and, um, and just growing and healing in general. And so it's a very interesting confluence, I think, of the art of photography 
the art, I guess, art of friendship and of community and of, um, and of healing and of, and of um, uh, thinking about our lives and about what we do with them and how we have come to be who we are and how that uh, is informed by and informs our photography. Um, and so with that, let me share my screen a little bit. We wanna show you some of the photographs in this book and talk a little bit about how they came to be. While I'm doing that, will you talk a little bit about the cameras that you use? We have two cameras here. Oh. Let's see, can we see them? This one's, we have a Q3 and I'll, I'll let you tell them. Let me share my screen. Well, I, um, I, have, I have shot with almost uh, every camera, I think, that Leica has made from the M9 till now. Uh, and it's, um, it's a good thing that I have this great relationship with, with Dan, because if, if, if not, I would, I would probably be broke by now. But <laughs> uh, so in, in all of my books that Dan just went through, virtually every photograph in there was, was taken with a like, and we'll talk about why I wound up shooting with Leica cameras because it's a relevant part of the story. Um, but the, the, the truth is over 20 years of photographing now, I've kind of worked my way into just three different cameras that I use. Uh, one camera is a film camera, which is an M6 TTL. Uh, I've got a 28 uh, millimeter Summicron spherical lens on that. Um, my roots in photography, when my mother, we'll, we'll talk a little bit, my mother got me started in photography and that was back in the late 1950s. And of course there was no digital, it was all film. And so film still has um, a, a lot of meaning to me. Uh, I have a, uh, an M11 digital rangefinder. Uh, the M6 is a rangefinder camera. The M11 is a rangefinder camera. There's something um, I just really, um, um, rangefinder cameras worked for me. Okay, it, it, it was uh, the perfect type of camera for the type of photographs that I made. And then finally, the third camera I have is the, the new Q3, which is very difficult to get. And it just takes patience. They're uh, making them. And, uh, yeah, my middle name is Patience, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. He really is. So, he's, he's great that way. There's a few people out there that know me that are laughing when I say that. So that's probably not really, <laughs> really accurate. But those are the three cameras that I that I use. I've used the SL cameras, which I love, but I've, uh, I've basically gone small and light. And those three cameras are all very small and light. Light and fast, baby. Yeah. That's the way to go. Yeah. Let me share my screen and we'll, we'll um, let's see here. Let me see if I can do this and we'll start this presentation. Yeah, okay. So. Well, well, you're doing that. Yeah. You, you mess with that and let me give a run. In. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. Let's talk about, let's talk so, about the book. So normally when Dan and I get together, um, it's, it's a, it's a, um, we have a lot of fun. There's, there's no question about that. That's true. Uh, and, and photography is great fun. This, this particular book is not one that you might uh, uh, view as being a fun book. And, and so uh, I, I, I think at least to set that tone, uh, we'll talk a little bit about what this what this book is about and wh why in the world would I make a book like this. Most of you that are watching probably have an idea of what this book is about. Um, and Dan, you've got your screen. Yeah, you've got that that photograph up there. Now, that's yep. a photograph of, uh, of my mother. She was uh, a beautiful lady, obviously. Um, and, and so we'll, we'll spend a little time just laying the groundwork for those of you that don't know, uh, what this story is about. Um, my mother was, um, I grew up in Washington, DC and loved photography. I was the firstborn child in the family and you know what it's like for a firstborn child. A lot of photographs taken of a firstborn child. And so, 
uh, as a as a little kid, I can remember my mom shot with a roll of flex, much like Vivian Meyer. And all the time I would see her looking down into <laughs> that roll of flex, taking photographs of me. Um, and so she introduced me to photography when I um, when I was probably five or six. She gave me my first camera. Uh, and I was thrilled to have that camera. And uh, it, we, we really bonded. At that time, I was the only child. My two siblings hadn't come along yet. My dad, who was a civil engineer, would be away at work. And so it was my mom and I together all day long. And she, um, she, she taught me how to compose a photograph. She challenged me about what I should make photographs of. Uh, she gave me incredible freedom. I, I had a little bicycle and it was, I call it my freedom machine. <laughs> and I would put my camera in the basket of my bike and I would just take off and ride all over our little, little town of Brownstown. Uh, and, and even out in, in five minutes, I could be out in the middle of the, the county on county roads and farm fields, which they would let little kids do things like that. Back then. <laughs> right. So very early on, I fell in love with photography and I fell in love with my mother. And uh, then, then unfortunately, um, a circumstance, and we'll, I'm, I'm going to just, the, the book goes into great detail. Uh, we're not here tonight to begin to try to tell the entire story. That's why you make a book. So hopefully <laughs> you'll, you'll buy the book. <clears throat> But there's information in this book for people that do buy it that's never been shared before. Uh, so I think there'll be a lot of interest there. Um, but um, when I was nine years old, I left our house one day and, and walked down the front steps, um, got on the school bus. The school bus took me to school. Uh, as soon as the school bus pulled away, uh, a mentally ill man with a shotgun walked into our house, uh, past my two little siblings who were sitting in the living room watching TV and having breakfast, uh, back towards the bedroom and bathroom of our house. Uh, the man had formerly been a, a boyfriend of my mother's. Um, at the time that he walked in that door, that day, he was about 30 years old. He had spent 15 of those 30 years in mental institutions and prisons. Um, and yet he was out. Um, walked back into the back part of my house, uh, proceeded to shoot my father, uh, nearly killing him, and then turned and, and put the shotgun in my mother's face and, and killed her instantly. Um, so, you know, in 1961 is when that occurred, November 28th of 61, in a small Indiana town, it just, it blew everybody's mind, okay? So <clears throat> that started uh, the photographs, I think you're all seeing on the screen here, there's a photograph of me with my mother. Um, there I am. This is this is kind of an interesting photograph. My mother made this photograph of me, and I was as a little kid. I was really into the cowboy thing back in the late 1950s. Cowboys were heroes for little kids like me, and so uh, there are several photographs in the book. And uh, you know, there there she is taking a photograph of me with me pointing both of my guns at her and the last thing that she saw in her life was a gun barrel pointed at her mm. face you know so it's kind of haunting when you look at that photograph to to, to see that uh, so uh, i've got a little imperial satellite hanging around my neck there uh this is a christmas eve at my paternal uh uh, grandparents' house. Actually, in this photograph are my great grandparents and my grandparents and my dad and me and my mom made this photograph. And this was about at a point in time in life when I just thought things couldn't be any better. I was uh, taking, I was going through black and white film like crazy with my <laughs> camera, and it was 
uh, shortly after this that I made the, the last photograph I ever made of my mother. Um, and so, yeah, let's, let's pause here for a second. Yeah, so, yeah. So to kind of give some context, I, I guess one question that, that you might ask would be, why, why would you spend so much time making a book on such a painful topic? Uh, and the, the truth is, it's, it's a story that really needs to be shared. And quite honestly, it, it doesn't, this story doesn't flatter me uh, a great deal, but it still needs, needs to be told. Um, why now? Uh, it really took a lifetime for me to be able to, to, to be able to tell this story. Right now is the only time I could have possibly told it uh, because it's a story that evolved over my entire lifetime. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's not just a story of incredible tragedy, although it was extremely tragic, but it's a story of recovery, which is, is important. Um, it, and it sheds, a, I think this book sheds a really important and a very bright light on three different topics, which was really what drove me to, to tell a painful story. Uh, the first thing is... Uh, it, it puts a bright light on the access to guns that mentally ill people had. They, 60 years ago, people, mentally ill people, had incredibly easy access to guns. Uh, 60 years later, today, that hasn't changed much. Yeah, not okay? a lot has changed. Not yeah. at all. <clears throat> the second thing is, uh, back in at the time this happened in the early 1960s in rural Indiana, uh, when something traumatic like this happened, they didn't have counseling for kids. There, there wasn't mental health counseling. So the, the trauma associated with this was something I wound up having to deal with on my own. And so that's, that's a big part of this story. And then finally, um, and it's, this is the, the, the uplifting part, is the ability of art and in my case, photography to help heal trauma. I didn't know that would ever happen, but that's the really uplifting part of, of this story. So uh, before we shift on to some, some next- Yeah, no, 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 keep going. We, we, wanna, we wanna look so, at your photographs too. So, so I'm just getting ready to share yeah. some more photos with you. I, but we have a question. Okay. 28. Right. A lot of what you shoot is 28 millimeters, which is why you like the Q3. Yes. Right. Yes. What do you have? That's a 35. No, it's got a 28 on both cameras. Yes. We have a question about what? primarily 28 on the on the M11 as well. Right. Ye, uh, 28 or 50 or 28 the only or two 50. focal lengths pretty much that I shoot with. Yeah. yeah. So I've got the 50 on the M11. And I think right you're now. a little bit like me or I'm a little bit like you in that 50 millimeters is telephoto for me. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't even think about it. 90 is just not something I'd even use. But anyway, so I want to address the questions. Um, but let me, can we, you want to start talking about photos? Can we show photos or? Uh, one more. Keep, one keep more. going. A couple of things. So, yeah. So in the book, should you happen to, to buy the book, which I, I hope you would. It just came out today. This is literally well, hot off the press. Actually, actually, let's say this. So for all of you that are watching, uh, if, if you go to my website, jsricephotography.com, you can order the book tonight. Uh, the rest of the world will be ordering that if they want it tomorrow. This is a limited edition. There's 250 copies. So it's for sale internationally. It's 40 bucks. If you want to get the book, go to my website. You can get it now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If, if it interests you, he's got the books in, and I imagine you'll sign them. Well, they're going to, that's a, diff oh, they're really? actually going to be shipped from. Oh, oh they're drop shipped. They're drop yeah, shipped. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's Not right. Well, that's a good excuse to come and visit Chicago or Indy and come to one of our programs and you can hang out with Jim, who is a lot of fun to be around and he'll sign your book. Okay. It's really beautiful stuff. So, yeah. so let, me, let me finish up before we get to yes. a, a few things to kind of to kind of fill in the story. So yeah. um, there were there were a couple of key things after this shooting event happened that that kind of set the stage for what happened the rest of my life. 
Um, and the, they weren't done, neither, neither of these things were done with any malice, but I think when I tell you what happened, you're gonna understand yeah. uh, what the source of the, the trauma was for me. So, I mean, the first obvious traumatic event, just having my grandfather come and pick me up and tell me that my mother had been shot to death mm. was enough within itself. But I got taken, uh, my grandfather took me to his house and all of our family is kind of gathered there and a lot of weeping and, and incredibly sad faces. Uh, my father was critically injured in the shooting and, and they didn't believe that he would survive. And a fellow uh, squatted down to me and he said, you know, Jimmy, your dad is probably not going to survive and you're going to need to be the man of the family. You were nine years old. I was nine years old. So, I mean, that's hard for somebody yeah. who's 29 to hear, let alone nine. Yeah. And so the uh, kind of the, the third piece to that, I was in a local restaurant in Brownstown called Brooks. Uh, all the folks from Brownstown that are watching will remember Brooks Restaurant. And I overheard a conversation uh, of, of a couple of men. And one of the men said, Jimmy forgot to lock the front door. Mm. I was like, oh my gosh. So mm. yeah, th those, were, those were the elements that uh, for me, in order to survive, I just had to stuff that down into my system yeah. which i did and you know over the course of um you know always after that as, as the book details i never felt normal yeah. i felt like all the kids that looked at me looked at me differently uh i never felt normal internally mm. um i kept conducting a normal life i had a great career as a civil engineer but as as time went on, I had a wonderful family, two kids, married my high school sweetheart. Um, but I became not an easy person to live with. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just, it, it was very difficult. Uh, and, and so at age 49, 40 years later, after the event, I found myself divorced and living alone. Yeah. And so at that point, I went to a mental health counselor, which I certainly needed. And in short order, he discovered that so much of this went back to this shooting and this trauma and all that that I had just shoved inside of me. Mm. And so he said to me, um, let's talk about your mother. And he said, what did your mother leave you? And I, I wasn't really, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that question. And I thought, and I said, well, photography. And he says, oh, so you're a photographer. And I said, actually, I've not really touched a camera seriously for 40 years. Yes, I had held little point and shoots when my sure. daughters were growing up and taking family pictures, but to seriously hold a camera and to make an artful photograph um, and that wasn't a conscious decision, but at that moment I realized I had, I had run away yeah. from that. Yeah. And so he looked at me and he said, well, maybe you should pick up a camera. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, what, what have I got to lose? So, uh, quite quickly, I, 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 it, everything was beginning to be digital then. So I, I bought some Nikon cameras and over the course of a year or two, I was shooting Nikon's top of the line. It was called back then it was called a D3, but it was their <laughs> top of the yep. line Nikon digital camera. And I was making photographs, but it wasn't like when I was a kid, I just, the, the, technically I learned how to use the camera. I'm an engineer. I could figure that stuff out but there just wasn't any soul in the, in the photographs. And I wasn't compelled 
to keep taking photographs. And then one night I was laying in bed, looking at a YouTube video on my iPad, and I see a video uh, of Craig Sumetko. I had no idea who Craig Sumetko was. And he was taking photographs with a Leica M9 rangefinder. Um, and I watched that video, uh, and it's maybe a four, four minute video. Um, I, I probably watched it 10 or 20 times straight <laughs> for, for, for a couple hours. I just kept watching. And the photographs that Craig made reminded me of the photographs that my mother took and the way that he made those photographs instantly reminded me that's how I used to take photographs when I was little. I'd forgotten that. I, I didn't remember that. Within a couple of days, I gathered up all my Nikon gear and I got rid of it. And I bought a Leica M9 rangefinder and it and used 50, 50 millimeter Summicron F2 lens. And I went out and when I started using, I'd never used a rangefinder camera before my Nikon was, uh, you know, it was autofocus. It was the Nikon was auto everything, you know? And I got the Leica M9 rangefinder and it's manual everything. And I had to think about everything <laughs> I was doing. And I started slowing down because I had no choice, but I remembered that video of Craig. And so I, I started, and this is gonna lead in Dan to the next photos you're gonna show. Uh, I started going back and taking photographs of things that I had taken photographs of as a kid. This is in my hometown of Brownstown, Indiana. When I was a little kid on my bike with my camera, I stood on this corner. The, the town has changed a lot in, in 60 years, uh, and it's nothing like it was <laughs> uh, when I was back there, but um, I got to the point where I was nothing like the little kid yeah. that, that I was when yeah. I was there either. Um, but as I went out and I started simply going back to places that I had been and starting to make the kind of photographs that I had made with my mother, stick with this one because there's a, there's a story here. Um, all of a sudden I could, I could feel things in me start to change. I could start, mm. I could start remembering things that mm. I, that, that I had long since forgotten. Uh, and, and I knew when I could feel it, when I was out there using this little rangefinder camera, taking these photographs, something in me was changing. Yeah. So I, I think for me, the response, um, I mean, I, when, when my mother was killed, I went on survival mode. Sure. Because I didn't think my dad was going to live. Um, and so work was one of the, one of the, the things that I did to kind of fill the void. So I always worked like crazy all the time. Um, and I wanted to be, I wanted to be, I was shooting for, I was shooting for perfection in everything <laughs> I did. And when, when I wasn't perfect or, uh, you know, if, if, uh, you know, trying to be a, a dad to the kids, it's not easy to be a dad and, um, uh, if, if my wife questioned me about anything, my reaction, you know, typically was to get angry, you know, and, and why, why, why would you question me? And, and I think that was to a great deal was because I went on survival mode. Still and, in survival uh, mode. I, yeah, I, was, I was, I was still in survival yeah. mode. And so when things didn't work out right, I just, I just got angry, yeah. you know, which, which wasn't, you know, really wasn't good. And it's also not you. No, no. Well, not me. Like now. now that I've come to know you, right? Um, right. It's, it's also kind. Of, it's also just not you. Yeah. And, you know, and I you, wasn't always. I mean, it wasn't yeah. like I was angry all the time. But uh, you know, to the point, as I started making these photographs, I could, 
I could feel that that internal anger start to go away. Yeah, I, I could feel it start to go away. And this photograph is uh, in a little community called uh, Sours, which is not far. I, I could ride my bike out the Sours. From, and I, I, I kind of laugh when I think about this. I've got grandkids that are, um, you know, that are eight and nine-ish right now. And I think, um, you know, if they took off on their bike and rode all the way out in the county like I did at that age, their parents would be out of their mind. They right, right, yeah, I mean, right. He's scared to death. But you know, when I took this photograph, there there were a lot of uh, a lot of things about this photograph. It reminded me of again, this is a photograph I would have taken as a kid. Yeah. But it it reminded me of the graveyard. Reminded me of the loss. Of the, course, the cross reminded me of the faith that sustained me. You, you know, throughout throughout all this time uh and the other the other part of this photograph was the you know the whole forgiveness aspect yeah uh, that you know that was a big part of i i, I remember my grandfather uh, coming up to me um the, the 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 man that killed my mother was eventually convicted of first degree murder and my grandfather came up and um, and my grandfather was was good. I had two great grandfathers, two two wonderful grandfathers that had a huge influence on me. But my my one grandfather said to me, "You you can rest assured that the guy that did this will burn in hell." <laughs> and I thought that just didn't sound right to me. So yeah. um, you know, I was able. I it was easier for me to you know, forgive the guy that did the shooting than it was for me to forgive myself. Yeah. Yeah. I think you, you also touched on something, Jim, a few moments ago um, that I think is really, is really important. The, the connection that you had with the Leica, and this is not about how Leica is the greatest camera in the world, which is what I believe. This is not about selling Leicas. This happens with all kinds of things, cars, pens watches everything in our lives some things we really connect with and the connection that you had with the Leica was what really was in a lot of ways a springboard for getting back into photography very much like what that gentleman at the mental health clinic said to you oh, yeah. about getting and so that I just want to highlight that we connect with things and all of us and recognizing the things that we connect with can really bring a lot of joy. Sometimes that's a camera. And, but, but in, in this yeah. in, very intensely personal and very real story, I think that it's important to just pause for a moment and think about how these connections that we have bring us closer to other people and in a way closer to ourselves. I mean, I, if you hadn't found like a buddy, I never, I don't know if I would have met you. So there's all these layers of things that happen and like the things that were said to you when you were very young, that stuck with you for so long, these little things, these connections that we have or the things that we say and the things that we hear and the things that we experience really do have long and lasting impact for us. A lot of stuff, especially with all of the stimuli that we have coming at us, things kind of tend to roll over or not get recognized, but taking a moment to sit with a thought and sit with the connection that we make with one another, with our hobbies, with our professions it is, is a really super powerful thing. Yeah, the let me talk about that. Yeah. First. So, so the importance of the the family that I the, the the photography family that I did not have before this, uh, how important that was uh, in the healing process over the course of uh, twenty years. Uh, a great example of that is this book. Let, let me tell you. Um, I, I'm just a, uh, a lot of you watching uh, maybe aren't a lot different than me. I mean, I'm, I'm not a photographer that is known all over the world, okay? But uh, photographers uh, that are known all over the world uh, help me with this, with this book. Uh, and I want to share with you just real quickly 
if, if you think this is just a book that that I put a pen to paper with and wrote a story and that I took my photographs and dropped them in here. It's the farthest thing from the truth. Uh, there, there were, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll just say some names. Uh, Jesse Marlowe, uh, for you photographers, you're all gonna know Jesse Marlowe is known all over the world. And um, he's from Australia and he did um, he, he put all kinds of work in helping me with this book. Craig Sumetko, so did Craig, Craig yep. Sumetko in Los Angeles helped me with this book. Um, Sally Davies, uh, was bouncing around between East Village and New York City and Palm Springs, California, and took the time to help me with this book. And let me add, Craig Sumetko was going through a double lung transplant. And in the middle of doing all that, still helped me with this book. Uh, finally, uh, God love you, my dear friend, Arthur Meyerson, uh, took time to help me on the publishing aspects <laughs> of this book. Uh, and then I had people that helped uh, look at the story. I had um, Richard Brejano in down near Dallas, Texas, who a lot of you Leica folks will know as executive director of Leica Society Internationally. He's a great writer. Uh, Karen Garlow, who uh, was a, a journalist that was a runner-up for a Pulitzer Prize while she was at the Shroud Observer, uh, worked on, on the text of, of this book. Uh, Jenny Honer, uh, the half of the Joe Honer and Jenny Honer team of True North Atti uh, Attitude, uh, travel all over the world. Uh, they do books. She she helped. She's a terrific on, writer. She helped on the editing uh, yep. of the writing. Her husband Joe worked on the photographs. Um, I I have graphic design artist Tammy Apple who's worked with me for uh, a couple of decades, and and I knew she could turn this book into a work of art. So it, it takes a whole lot of people to do this, but, but these people are all part of the photographic family that helped me in the healing process. And without them, I wouldn't be here tonight. It's a community project, it man. Is. That's one of, that's, that's really what this, the conversation is all about. Uh, we're going to look at some more photos, right? And we want to also, we have Jesse Marlowe here on the call as well. And so in a few minutes, we want to bring him in and we could talk a little bit about the curatorial process and the bookmaking process. Um, it, but before we do, there was a couple of things that you touched on. First of all, for anybody who has been to Jim's website and is trying to check out for the book, if you have any difficulty, send me an email. We're going to get there. We just can't do the tech now while we're here on the phone with you, uh, on the call with you. Uh, but please do reach out to me or Jim, and we'll make sure that the, the checkout process is a little bit easier. Hey, will you make sure that you mention when we're looking at photos, what cameras you use? Because there's some curiosity about that. Uh, if, in as much as you remember, in as much as you remember, yeah. but um, I want to mention something. Someone asked about the idea, interested in your photography in terms of looking back as a cathartic experience versus looking forward to the joy of the new <clears throat> and has the balance of, uh, balance of how you shoot, maybe what you think about yeah. changed over time. So... Yeah. It's, so this book, as I said at the beginning, was was really a lifetime in the making, so to speak. But it was only in the last couple of years that that I was really motivated to to make it happen. And I knew that in the process of making this happen, I had to do a lot of looking back. And I knew that that looking back was was going to be really painful. My wife could verify um, there's a lot of nights I didn't sleep. This is a really brave thing. That you there, did. There, there was a lot of nights that I didn't sleep because I went back. Uh, uh, I just went back in time and relived so much of what happened, which I had to do to, to tell the story. It's an interesting thing. Uh, uh, people who have, who have suffered the kind of trauma that, that I suffered a lot of that memory really gets burned into your mind. 
Mm -hmm. You don't forget it. And so I was able to write with a lot of detail in here in, in terms of the trauma that happened. But to answer that question, uh, completing this book uh, is a moving forward process. Uh, the, the healing, I feel like, has, has, it's, it's really been good. It's, it's probably mm -hmm. a process that's never over. But um, I, I fully believe that had I not, had, had my counselor not suggested that I pick up a camera, that I might not be where I'm at today. I, pr I probably wouldn't be. Uh, I've been able to uh, reestablish relationships with the family that I pretty much burned, which I didn't know if I ever would. Uh, and Again, sometimes just a simple sentence has enormous impact. Yes. Yeah, it has enormous. It really, Jim, this thing that you've done is really brave. I know that it's been good for you um, ultimately, but I just want to, I just want to, you know, take my hat off, so to speak. It's really brave. It was, it was hard. Before yeah. we start, and it's difficult too. I mean, this yeah, is no, yeah. so before we start looking at photographs, as we are looking at photographs, I want you to please feel free to ask more questions um, either during or after the presentation. Jim's book is divided into three, uh, well, really four sections. The prologue, shooting to kill, shooting to heal, and an epilogue. And it's beautifully written. The book is full of prose and photographs. In, here in our gallery in downtown Chicago tomorrow night, we're gonna unveil the opening of the show, which is in the gallery over here to our left. And many of these photographs are hanging on the walls. And if you are in Chicago, we urge you to join us and you get a chance to meet and talk with yeah. Jim too, which is always a lot of fun. Um, but I wanted to show the structure of the book um, and say that there's a lot of prose and the story, all of this story is in there, uh, as well as a lot of photographs. So uh, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to start to look at photographs, and I'll try to remember to ask you what camera you were using. Yeah, but, I'll try. Yeah, we'll, we'll try. Um, but also feel free, you know, any, any questions that come up, and sometimes questions come to us later, and we hope that you sit with these images and this presentation and that it is meaningful for you and that questions emerge. And if they do, please reach out to Jim or to myself. Um, and we would love to continue the conversation. And I hope I answered that question adequately, but you know, there, there was, there was a lot of intense pain and in looking back and it took a couple of years to do this book. And, you know, my wife would say I, I disappeared into my studio in the basement <laughs> for almost a couple of years. And, and it was really tough. Was there a time when you were taking pictures where you realized you're like, oh, wow, I just took that photograph for myself. This was not so much about the exploratory. There was a time when I began to realize that the uh, when I had a camera in my hands and I was out, most of these were solitary moments when I was out by myself and, and I just felt myself getting better. I, yeah. I, I started remembering things about my mother that I had forgotten. I'll tell you one interesting, really quick tidbit here. Uh, and again, this goes back to the incredible power of trauma. Of all the people in my life that I've known, my, my grandparents, my aunts, uncles, friends, everybody in my life that I've known who has died I can still, when I think about them, I can still remember their voice. You understand what I'm saying? I think most of you can relate to that, except for one person. Mm. Who do you yeah. think? Marilyn. My mom. Yeah. I, I've never remembered her voice, which I was with her for nine years, which I think is remarkable and kind of strange. But it, again, mm. it shows you the, the, you know, the lingering of, of the trauma. The other thing that my wife would tell you is I lock the doors two or three times every, <laughs> every night. Yeah. Yeah. Every night. I'll never Still. forget the first time you told me that you couldn't remember your mom's voice and yeah. I can't get that moment out of my head. Yeah. Um, it's again, it's just, it's, it's really brave and I, and it's a really good thing. And I think that the, the, it's interesting because photography very often is a solitary pursuit. We alone see the viewfinder and we alone click the shutter and we alone make the image. Even if we have friends at our sides and we're all out shooting together or whatever, it is a very intensely personal 
experience and singular experience, you know? And that's one of the things that makes monographs and gallery shows and conversations like this so very important to connect other photographers because we all learn from one another and we all take influence and inspiration from one another. I've certainly have been inspired by Jim in many ways through our friendship over these years. Um, let's talk about how the book came to be because we ha- we know a lot of the yeah. background and um, a lot of these photos, I'm going to share my screen again, and we're going to start to move through some photos. A lot of these photographs, are, are these presented kind of in the order they were taken? No, or? no. So that's, that's I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. So uh, they're really kind of, uh, when we get to the photograph section in the book, they're, it's, it's kind of in three pieces. The first piece are a series of photographs that I realized I was taking photographs like I would have continued to take as a little boy if I would have had the chance, but I didn't have the chance. And so as I started looking at those photographs, I realized realized these are the photographs I would have taken as a little boy. And after I had made those photographs, I, 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 I knew, I didn't understand how it was working, but I knew that, that photography was helping heal, heal me healed the trauma that I had. The second series of photographs that I noticed I had a bunch of were photographs that I took in bars. And we'll talk in a little bit about why that is. There's a reason that is, but the second series was photographs I took in bars in taverns. The last uh, group of photographs in the book are photographs that I call life as it happens, and and those were photographs. Uh, many of those, when I actually up here in Chicago, Chicago became like a second home to me. Uh, I think because in a, an old city like Chicago, there are places I can go that remind me of what it was like in the 1950s and 60s, and so I'm very comfortable there. And so the last series were photographs that were called life as it happens, but yet in each of those photographs, there's something special about that photograph that, that relates to my, my process of, of trauma and of healing. So this photograph um, was actually taken in, in Carmel. That, that's a photograph, that's film. That was on my M6. Uh, and I think that's probably Tri-X film. Uh, when I saw that fellow's hat, um, uh, it reminded me back in the fifties and sixties, everybody wore hats like that all the time. Yeah. And instantly when I saw that, I was just taking it. I felt like I was back in the late 1950s. The minute, yeah. I, the minute I saw that photograph, Saul yeah. Leiter is a photographer that's influenced me greatly. And he loves to shoot through windows and glass and and you, so you do have, you've got a couple so, of Saul Leiter uh, bones in your body there. I do. Um, uh, let's, as we're moving through these photographs, I would like, if it's okay with you, I'd like to bring Jesse Marlowe in because you guys collaborated. So, uh, yeah. Can I say yeah? something about Yeah, 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 absolutely. I'm just going to go to the next, is, can I go yeah, to the next photo? Yeah. yeah. And hey, uh, John, can we bring Jesse in? Hi, Jesse. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Excellent. So, uh, y- you know, I-, I said earlier, uh, Je- Jesse is, I-, I took a like Academy class with Jesse and uh, I instantly had this um, huge amount of respect for him. He, uh, I, I, I've probably told him more times than he wants to hear, but I said, Jesse, uh, when, when the end of your days come and, and the end of your photography career, people aren't as much going to remember your photographs, but they're going to remember your character. I, I think you remember me saying yeah, yeah. And, and Jesse's character just, he, he touched me. He was not only is he a great photographer, but he was such a kind, um, gentle spirit and so caring and, um, and he I, is. I wish he lived closer. I, 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 and, I wish he lived closer. And so when I started yeah. this book, I, as, as tough as this book was, I thought um, he is he is the guy yeah. that could help me get through this. And so Jesse and I spent an incredible amount of time together. And 
um, and he he had the full freedom to say ah, this photograph shouldn't be in here or this one should be in here and uh, I, I th this book would would not have got done properly and and it <laughs> wouldn't be the book it was with without his help but it was it was a very moving process and a learning process for me and I think it's a reminder as a photographer. Uh, don't try to do these things. Don't try to do a book by yourself, you know, but I am blessed to have uh, someone of Jesse's. Jesse did not need to take time to help someone like me, but he did. <laughs> it's all, it's, it's all community, baby. I want to yeah. leave it to you guys and I'm going to share my screen and let y'all talk about the photographs and the process. So let me share my screen here and Jim this is one of my favorite photographs uh that you took in this book and with that I love this picture and with that I'm going to shut up well that <laughs> that uh that was in my hometown of Brownstown and uh the significance of, of that photograph is is really uh, the bicycle I think uh because the bicycle became my it was my freedom machine as I call it in the book I would put my I would put my camera in the basket of my bike and I would take off and, and go make photographs. And um, my mother encouraged me to do that. Um, and I think the fact that the sign right next to that bicycle says courthouse on it. Uh, <laughs> what? You know, I'm going to read it. Uh, yeah. awesome. I, think I think there's some significance, some significance there. So, um, you know, when, when Jesse, um, yeah. Jesse, I don't remember how many photographs we had, but you know, whenever you start to make a book, um, you're telling a story and the sequence of the photographs and what photographs you actually use are very, very important. Uh, I don't think there's many photographers that would have taken the time to understand the kind of story I was telling with this book as Jesse did. Uh, and and I think he is a he is a rare photographer. He he immediately caught on uh, what I was trying to do, and and as I said, without him, I I I couldn't have done it. His everything right. he asked me to do, there there wasn't anything he asked me to do that I said no. It's important. And I said I was going to shut up, but here I am chiming in again. So Jesse is Jesse is a terrific photographer, really nice guy, and. Uh, he knows a lot about bookmaking as having published some books himself and also uh, has done what I thought to be some very interesting classes on bookmaking. And so part of the curatorial process and part of all of this is it's not just taking pictures, uh, but it's figuring out which pictures are the best ones and how to how to place them, how to choose and having someone, especially with Jesse's experience or just so, another set of eyes can be a very important thing. Um, uh, let's look at the next. So, yeah, these are the ones that, that go to the, the bar section. So there's a story I got to tell here. <clears throat> so after the shooting, I was living with my grandparents. My father was in the hospital for a long, long time. And the only male that I had that was kind of a, that, that, that was the same age as my father that was still around was my uncle Pokey and my uncle Pokey um, had a tavern in our, and it was, it was the best tavern in our, it was in uh, Brownstown has kind of a little twin town that goes along with it called Ewing. And he had a, he had Pokey's tavern in Ewing. And so even though I didn't carry a camera with me anymore, cause I just, I went I couldn't, I couldn't pick up a camera because it reminded me of my mother, but I didn't quit exploring. <laughs> so I kept looking with my eyes. So uh, I would sneak in to Pokey's Tavern. And, and back in the day in the late 50s and the early 60s in, in, in Brownstown, uh, it was kind of an unspoken truth that if you went to a tavern, you were drunk. Whether you were or not, right. you were assumed to be a drunk. Right. And, and so when I looked in my Uncle Pokey's tavern, I saw neon lights. I, I, I saw people having a great time. I heard the clinking of beer bottles. I mean, 
and there weren't a bunch of drunks in there. There might have might have been a drunk or two in my Uncle Popey's tavern, but it wasn't generally right. speaking, it wasn't what I had in my mind, what I thought it would be. Uh, and my Uncle Pokey was instrumental. Um, you'll this is goes into detail in the book, but ironically, after my mother was shot. I had a lot of kids that would make fun of me and pick on me. Man. Now, you can't imagine that that would happen after such a horrible thing, but it did. And my uncle Pokey um, uh, said quite succinctly to me, we, I was whining about kids beating me up and making fun of me. And my uncle Pokey asked me, what are you going to do about it? And I, I just kind of stood there and said, I don't know. And so he just shoved me right on my butt. And then it just as quickly grabbed me up and stood me on my feet. And he said, you're either going to learn to fight or you're going to spend the rest of your life with people kicking your ass. <laughs> you know, it, was, it was kind of my uncle. And there's Pokey. some truth to that. And there's I some think, truth but... to that. And so uh, I found myself taking a lot of photographs in taverns like like this photograph were there right photographs here. that were there photographs like this one that you didn't use well that looks or... like that looks like my uncle pokey yeah tavern. yeah and it's not that's a that's that's at a place in lafayette but it but that is what i would that's reminded me of my uncle yeah. pokey's tavern and so you know the the thing that i discovered in going to taverns and making photographs is that that people will tell you things in taverns they will they will tell things to a perfect stranger that they would not tell to a mental health counselor right in a mental health counselor's office you know i heard i heard some horrific stories of pain i heard some mm. incredibly funny stories but but i really there was there was a piece of the photographs that i made like you see on this screen here that was in asheville uh, look at the woman. I mean, you can tell she's just in, she's spilling her guts to the lady. There's next something to her. happening there. She's yeah. got her hand on her head. That picture, that picture says everything to me in terms of, you know, she's, she's got something in life that's not good. And that's, that's where she's telling her story. This is an M11 or a Q3. No, 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 that, no. This was down in Asheville. That was probably, Q2. Uh, no, that was on an M camera. That was probably on the uh, uh, 246 monochrome, I do believe. Asheville was that long ago? Yes. My goodness. Yes. Um, Just looking at that photo, guys, that um, that placement, Jim, with the um, with the wine glass and just, you know, with that light color jumper she's got on and, and that expression, it's just such a, a powerful image. And I remember when... You know, when we were going through the edit and, and this was, you know, in the the initial edit, it was it was such a powerful picture that really, um, you know, it just sprung out and it had, had to be in the book. You know, uh, first of all, I just love I, I love to hear you talk, Jesse. I love your I love your Australian accent. Uh, and I, I miss that. I miss you. I could uh, listen to you all day. Thanks, uh, mate. You know, some people would say, well, look, that photograph's not exactly really sharp, uh, which it isn't, um, or her face is blown out. But, um, you know, Robert Frank's The Americans was was probably uh, a work uh, that, that influenced me as much as, as anything. And this reminds me of a photograph that you would have seen in The Americans, mm. actually. Yeah. And absolutely. And these were the kind of these were the kind of results that I would get when I shot on film, you know, as a kid. I can remember that's that's what <laughs> kind of what my my black and white photographs would look like. But, uh, you, you know, there, there's what you begin to see these photographs that are in this book. You can see how they are connected to uh, either the trauma that I suffered or my road out of that trauma. Right. Yeah. And if I can just jump in, I think that was the the first thing that when, you know, you first sent me the um, the book dummy and from memory, I think there was probably maybe 80 something pictures in the book. And yeah. I remember we caught up and we had a zoom and we were looking, looking through it together. And, and I think from memory for me, it was, it was going back through the work and, and really um, sort of pinpointing the photos that, 
I suppose, linked back really clearly visually to the story. And I think that was that was how I started to see the, you know, the the book and the the editing sequence sort of unfold and how it kind of had to play out. It was almost like for me, it was like less photos were really going to help tell that story. It's true. And and you know, the reason I said don't for photographers out there listening, don't try to do this on your own. It's important to have Jesse's I and and Craig's eye and Sally Davies eye and Joe Honer's eye, uh, other than just mine, uh, as an outside perspective, because it's easy as a photographer to fall in love with a certain picture and that uh, you're so emotionally attached to that picture yeah. that it it's not the right one to be in there. And Jesse did a great job, and he was so kind and. And, and gentle and helping me through it. And it, it was just a, a wonderful part of the process. Um, Bars and taverns. Yeah, this this again is another one at a, at a bar and a tavern. And, you know, the guy's taking, taking a quick shot there. And, and uh, you know, I... Uh, it's kind it, of a sweet moment that well, you have here. The, the other mean... piece of this is the guy that, the man that killed my mother spent the night before he did the shooting sitting in a bar getting drunk right right okay. right and that's another good example of picture that that really you know just that that lone figure sitting at the bar on his own i remember there was some other pictures that were sort of alongside this one that were maybe sort of busier you know bar scenes but it, it, to me it, this picture really you know once again linked back to the story and and it was a, another vital picture that helped tell it so it was a really good addition so yeah this story kind of shifts into the segment of uh, uh this is this is out of the the kind of the, the bar segment into the, the life, life as it happens, happens yeah. you know and and i was in this was in Asheville uh as well so monochrome 246 Still, and like a, a monochrome and a 26 yeah mm -hmm. and a 28 and and this kid looked so much <laughs> like me when i was about that age and i remembered that for years after that shooting happened it was it was still hard for me to believe that it actually happened and i kept thinking that at some point in time my mother's just going to appear out of nowhere and she's going to tell me this was all a mistake right okay and when I saw this kid looking through that wrought iron fence, I just felt like he's he's looking for a miracle, like I was. <laughs> he's he's looking, you know. That was that was me, you know. I yeah. saw I saw me in that. So that's the the yeah. story in that. Uh, yeah, this, you know, I actually made this photograph when I was when Jesse was here with me in Chicago at the, at the academy. Yeah. So this yeah. was. M11 and this was a Q3. Q3. This was a I'm striking three. out here. I really am striking yeah, out. This was a Q3. Anyway. So the significance of this was, um, I mean, I was walking. Uh, I, I I love Chicago, and I there there are so many wonderful things to see in a city of this size, and stories that just unfold before you. But this it's kind of a warm day. This guy doesn't have his shirt on. He's 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 got a medicine ball and I see him coming towards me and he's, and it's like, why would a guy have a great big heavy medicine ball out on the street? I have no idea, but I waited until he picked it up and threw it on his shoulder and he started walking off. And there was just something very poetic about that, mm. that scene. But, but after I got that, I, I realized that, you know, for years, I felt like I was carrying the world hmm. on my shoulder. I mean, I felt and like I had the weight of the world on my shoulder. That's so and, interesting, Jim, because I've, I, again, yeah, I didn't did even it, think of that. I kind of wondered, like, why yeah. did he pick this one? And, and so one of the things I talk about in my book is I, you know, I'm not a neuropsychologist. I, I'm, I'm an engineer and a photographer. Um, but I do believe that that there is a direct connection between my subconsciousness and what I actually, the photographs I take yeah, with yeah. my camera. There, there is yeah. no doubt there is a connection. I, I agree. And I think it's one of those things where every, in every art form, some of the artist's own sensibilities and it comes out in the art. 
Yeah. Let's see what's next. I love this picture. Yeah, so th this photograph is actually one of my favorite photographs of all time. Uh, I, I had, uh, th this was with an M, um, and, and I think this might have been uh, uh, the M10M, I think is probably mm -hmm. what, I, what I took this photograph with. Again, with a 28 millimeter lens, I'd, I'd been out all day on the streets uh, of Chicago, uh, and I was worn out. Uh, and then as it so frequently happens, when you think you're done for the day, <laughs> um, I, I, I had just made a photograph and, and I had set my camera, uh, I'd opened the aperture up to F2 to, to make a, a photograph right prior to this one. I normally, uh, when I'm on the street, I zone focus. So I'll have the camera set on F11. Uh, and zone focus. And so I'll have everything from, you know, you know, maybe uh, three and a half feet to, to 25 feet, you know, yeah. in focus. And, um, and that's what I typically do. But I had just shot at F2. I turn around and I see this scene coming towards me. And, and I had to, you know, really make a quick decision. What, what am I going to do? And fortunately, I um, a lot of times you just miss the shot, but I, I got this shot and th this shot, uh, reminded me of when I was a little kid before the shooting, uh, my mom and dad and I used to walk to church together and they, they would dress me up in my church clothes and we would walk a few blocks from our house to church. And this whole, this is in this photograph, it's, this is the whole family is strung all the way back to the guy at the tail end pushing mm -hmm. the stroller. So it's a big family. Uh, and it looks like they've all just come out of church. I think it was the, actually a Sunday. The, the, yeah. The way they're all dressed. And mm -hmm. uh, this photograph, you know, came, I, just look at the dreamy look that the, the girls yeah. have in their eye and they're, yeah. they, they're all holding their mom's hand and you know it's one one big happy family and i thought i lost that yeah that there's a yeah i can see why this i think this is a very powerful photograph it's also one of, one of my favorites and, and that photo in the book is just uh it's a double page spread from memory jim it's a real it's a real standout like the the low yeah. the low angle the the viewpoint of the the young the young boy that um yeah it's just it's a it's an absolute stunner that one so uh, this photo is that's on the screen now is in Boston. Um, this is another example of uh, how just the fact that I picked up a camera, uh, it, it so connected me back to things that I had lost. Um, I was walking along the street and this fellow in the white jacket, uh, if you look really closely at the, at the way he purses his lips and the way he holds his hand is exactly like my grandfather used <laughs> to do. And, and I saw that in an instant and, and, and that's why I made that photograph. And I, and so whenever I think of that, it just immediately reminds me of my grandfather Hanners. That's just yeah. exactly how he held his hands, <laughs> how he pursed his lips. And did you, did you realize that at the moment? I realized that at the moment I was making that. And what, now, when 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 you and Jesse or when you guys were curating, was that was that something that that you had that you guys talked about, or was this a photograph that you both recognized immediately was part of this story? And the reason I ask is because to yeah. my eyes, it is not overtly part of the story, other than just the relationship that people have, and of course the similarities to to Grandpa Hannah. Well, it, it, it's part of the story because, um, you know, after the shooting, I was living with my grandparents. And, and so he was, uh, he was a very influential person in, in my life, you know, so I, I think that's, that's the relevance of it. But, yeah. But as far as, you know, I, uh, I think Jesse, Jesse can answer, but I think he caught on to, to what, what were, uh, and a lot of the photographs that we kind of dumped out, it wasn't so much yeah. that they didn't tell the story, but it's like 
they didn't tell the story as well as some others did. Would, would yeah. that be right, Jesse? Yeah, look, from memory, uh, there was also, you know, with the Zoom sessions that we did together, there was, I mean, you had such powerful, uh, interesting stories about so many of these photos. And I think when we started to sort of curate it and really dig further into it and, and start to cull some of the other pictures, I think from memory, we were talking about captioning and 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 you describing what's going on and how it linked back to to your childhood and and your um and those those years so i think that was i think another really important part of the the sequence was the the captions that you ended up um using with a lot of the photos so that was yeah hearing about your grandfather and and that that memory that that um that guy's they're all there yeah they're all yeah. there yeah, yeah. Sure. And that was how do you I think have... this is laid out what Jesse is talking about is many of these images have text next to them. So that's what he's referring to. Yeah, and from early on with the first draft of the book, Jim, remember the, um, I think, you know, there was that, I mean, you had a lot of pairing going on. You had photos that you were sort of trying to link yeah. uh, together with sort of like little visual links. But I think uh, what we sort of, I think where we ended up with just having just that that standalone picture and the caption and, and you talking about that that past of yours i think that was that was the i think it really just strengthened the 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 images it, it did jesse jesse was responsible for helping me understand that in in this particular book that it was best that there was one photograph on a page and on the other page there was the piece of the story and not not to put photographs side side by side I, and, and that made that made all the difference in this book I think, I think with yeah with photography i think it's i think it's a, a bit of a, a, a sort of a an easy option isn't it because we we go out as, as street photographers and we amass different photos from different places and then we try to sort of curate them into a, a book or a, an exhibition and then we tr end up linking them because there might be you know some sort of visual link between two photos but really I think it's it's often just the strength of the standalone image, and I was really um, pushing and urging you to sort of uh, you know think about that and treat these pictures as as just individual images that that really told the story. And I think I'm glad you I'm glad you agreed, and I think it, it's really helped with the book. It did. It was wonderful, and I I I can't thank you enough for not just that piece, but all all that you did, Jesse, and the, the, the time you were willing to, to give as part of this project. I owe you. <laughs> Have a day one day. <laughs> um, so this photograph, uh, I can remember when this was in Lafayette, when I made this photograph, this, this dog was just laying in this door and this, this shard of light was was coming down and and just hitting him in the eyes and even as I squatted down to make this photograph he didn't move and he and his eyes he was just kind of staring off into the distance and I thought I remember feeling like that mm. it's like days when I when I just needed yeah. needed the sun to shine in my eyes and give give me hope to right. get up and and move again mm. that's exactly what i felt like and and i was stunned that the dog just laid there and let me <laughs> take this photograph you know there was you could almost i mean as photographers i think you'll understand this you could i could just almost feel this it's like this dog knew why i needed to take this photograph that sounds <laughs> crazy but I'm just telling you Wow. Yeah. So when um, when I got on the school bus and rode to school and the man walked in and, and shot my parents, um, I didn't obviously know what happened. And so I was in the classroom. Uh, I was in the fourth grade and the principal walked into our classroom and interrupted the classroom and he um, he was kind of a, he was a wonderfully kind guy, but he could also put the fear of God in you. And there was a rumor that he had an electric paddle <laughs> in his office, of course. <laughs> uh, and when he walked in the door, I thought to my, I can remember, I thought to myself, somebody in this room is in big trouble. He's getting a whooping. And somebody's yeah. <laughs> going to get a whooping. And he walked up and talked to the, my teacher and to my horror, 
they walked straight back to my desk and, and to me. Mm. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, I was just frozen. And anyway, they told me to get my books. My grandfather was here to get me. My grandfather took me out and he put me, shoved me into the seat of his old Buick. And this is a picture of an old Buick. And he shoved me in the front seat of the Buick and he, and he just said to me, Jimmy, your mom has been shot to death. Uh, my grandfather taught school in a little town called Olytic, Indiana, which is kind of the limestone center of, uh, of America. Most of the limestone in buildings in New York City, Washington, D.C., Chicago, all came from, from this little town not far from where I lived. And my grandfather taught school in Olytic. Many, many years later, I am in Olytic retracing the steps where he's at, and I find this old Buick with what looks like a bullet hole in the windshield right by the school that he used to teach in, in a, in a little car shop called Wicked hmm. Ways Customs. <laughs> and... Uh, I took this shot with my M6. This is a film shot, but my hands were shaking so much that I didn't know if I could take the photograph mm. because it it was it 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 looked just like my grandfather's car. And then the thought occurred to me: I don't know that that wasn't my grandfather's car. It could have been. He could have because he worked in Olytic. He could have traded that car my DNA could be in that car. Huh. That could be the very car that, that could rode be the in. very car where I heard what happened to my mother. And the fact that there was a bullet hole in the windshield, um, it, it, I, I don't think I need to say anymore. That, I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, one of the comments that we had earlier was, um, and I want, just want to acknowledge it because I think it's a very important thing we touched on earlier that words can hurt words matter. They can hurt and they can heal as can experiences such as this, finding this car. And I think there's probably not a lot of question uh, uh, how that this fits, that this fits into the book. Now I've got a confession to make. I don't remember how many more images we have, but um, can you talk a little bit about how you selected images to bring to your and Jesse's meeting and how, and whether, or how you selected images, obviously all part of retelling the story in either shooting to kill, shooting to heal, or life as it happens, and these kind of stages. But how did you, I'm, we're interested in how your background as a civil engineer influences <laughs> your photography, but also really about the curatorial process, because a lot of this book is really, a, it's not just about the healing but it's also about this curatorial process and how do you take these di perhaps disparate parts and put them together especially with prose to make a story yeah well again uh this book is kind of a result of two intense years of my mm. life and so mm. uh the story um the, the, just writing the story was really, really difficult. Sure. I, I mean, and, and again, for those of you that would buy the book, you're going to, you're going to hear a story. You're going to, people in my hometown are going to find out things they never knew. Um, but uh, that was one process. The photographs, um, you know, I, th I think as a photographer, it's not unlike being um, somebody who writes a song. Yeah. Uh, when you when you write a song, that almost becomes like a like a child or a baby to <laughs> yeah. you. Photographs, uh, as a photographer, you have a sense of knowing what 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 ones in your archive really have yeah. a certain meaning to them. And so, I think the original set of eighty plus photographs that I that I sent to Jesse um, were, were photographs that spoke to me that 
that, that either I felt like they told the story or some of them, when I actually made the photograph, they were part of, uh, when I actually had the camera in my eye and I made the photograph, uh, I knew there was something special there yeah. that, that was part, again, part of that healing process. So I think everything was focused uh, for me, particularly on the photographs of selecting photographs that told um, that, that both showed and told my journey from, from yeah. some real darkness, um, you know, to, to, to something, the end is a good story. I mean, yeah. you know, the, almost everything that I lost, I got back, you know, and, and here's another piece, you know, when something really horrible happens to you as a human, it's, it's, you can feel like everything is lost. I I've, I've lost everything. Mm. And yet, you know, many, many years later, I discovered my mother threw me a lifeline, mm. you know, by giving me photography. Yeah. You know, it was, it's, it's wonderful. And so, uh, you know, I thought I had lost my original family, you know, uh, and uh, not so. Right. Not so. Right. Uh, Jesse, we're there. We're there. I'm going to put you on the spot, brother. Yeah. We're there <laughs> times when you looked at some of Jim's photos and said, yeah, this, I don't think this tells the story that you wanted to tell or that you maybe questioned why it was in. Tell me a little bit about how you helped Jim figure out which was, what was the, not the right thing, but how, how you all arrived where, where you arrived with some of these images. Yeah. Well, I must admit when uh, Jim first told me about, uh, you know, what had happened and how he'd sort of rediscovered photography back when I was in Chicago last year. And uh, I remember, you know, just sitting there at your store and I was, I was in shock and I was numb. And I remember walking back to my hotel that night and called my wife and I, I told her, you know, in great detail this this story that um about james and i was really uh you know taken aback by it obviously and straight away just struck up this this friendship and connection with him and also because my mother had um you know given me a camera as an eight-year-old boy and and that's how i i'd got into photography and and you know she'd drive me around taking photos so we we really hit it off um initially just with, with that connection and then obviously with with what had happened to James but then I felt this when James then sent me the the first draft of the book I, I remember I remember sort of opening the package up and 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 sitting there and, and looking at it and and being really I suppose it probably took me a few days to even kind of uh digest it and and, and sort of get my head around the story because it was it's such a, a personal story and and James had kind of said to me go for it. Tell me, tell me what you think, hit me with it. And I just remember feeling this kind of um, weight on my shoulders in that, you know, I wanted to tell him what I thought of some of the pictures, but I think, um, you know, there was that apprehension and, and sort of, I was just, yeah, yeah. just felt a bit funny about not being critical, but being sort of, you know, constructive with, with, with my thoughts. So once we sort of got onto the Zoom and, and he reassured me, no, just go for it. Tell me what you think. Uh, that made it easier. And then I think from there, we just sort of just bounced ideas back and forth and, and really try to, like I said before, just bring it straight back to photos that really linked back to the story. And then it became a, a pretty easy process after that. And once James said, yeah, I'm happy with, with less pictures, I think it needs it. That was a really... Um, yeah, it just it, it sort of took some weight off off me as a you know, yeah. co curator of the of the book. I hope you didn't ever feel uh, too nervous. I I think uh, I just want to echo a, at least from my end, I've I've always felt really comfortable around you from the get go. Whatever whatever that magic was, but there were <laughs> few people on earth that could have helped me with this like you did. Thank you. No, it's been. Yeah, it's been an amazing little last six months working with you on, and I'm so happy to to see you get it finally out there and and this story, you know, being told as as you are and with the show tomorrow night. And wish I was there to to sort of 
celebrate it with you. <laughs> I promised you that I'm going to come to Australia. Yeah, come on. Get down so, here. <laughs> that far? I'll probably be in tow. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll come and visit. I'm here. I think you guys did a terrific job with this book. It's really, it's really wonderful. It really is beautiful. I can't wait to read it again. And I'm so excited to see, um, to see it here in the flesh and, and congratulations on doing this really amazing and brave and beautiful and touching work. It's really, it's, it's just wonderful. Can you, will you talk for a moment about what you see when you look in the viewfinder? Like, are you, do you, when you look into the viewfinder, are you, do you see yourself telling a story or are you kind of deduce the story after the photograph has been made? Can you talk a little bit about what it's like when you do put your eye to the viewfinder? Well, I think that varies depending upon what type of photograph I'm where, where I'm at, what type of photograph I'm, yeah. I'm taking. Um, I've got a, I've got a number of long-term projects that I've worked on. And so, I mean, as a contrast, I, I love working in urban areas. I love being in Chicago. Right. But I've also been documenting rural America for, for about 20 years or so. And so I, I shoot quite differently when I'm in rural America as I would when I'm in a city. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, I, I don't typically, uh, have a preconceived notion of what I'm going to take a photograph yeah. of, and I would rather let the world kind of come to me. And, and, and then I think as a photographer, one of the things that my mother was really good at helping me with was was how to compose a photograph mm. but i think there's a certain genetic it's kind of like singing if if your <laughs> parents had a great voice maybe you'll have a good voice and so you can sing and i think to some degree i just i i was gifted with a genetic of being able to to, to see um and and so i think for many photographers we see things differently than what non-photographers mm. see so at least for me, when I am out taking photographs, I want to let the experience of life come to me. And, and then it's my job to put that in the frame in a way that makes it something really special. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, how to I pick that moment. That's how I, mean, I try to do That's how I try to do it. I just want to show everyone these photographs once again and encourage you folks to um, feel free to ask questions. Um, do we have any more questions that we haven't answered? No. Has well, everybody how, so you're a civil engineer. How, what, if, how does like the, this question came in when you were talking about aperture and stuff like that. So like zone focusing, for example, is the first thing that comes to my mind when I think about how Jim's engineering background influences how you shoot. Yeah. Um, but that's maybe more nuts and bolts. Thing. like do you see a connection between um between your profession and the when you're putting your eye to the viewfinder not, or they're not, not, not really I, yeah. I think i think engineering and photography so uh i can't remember what the name of 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 the the tests are that uh that that they give you but uh what is it but at any rate uh I, you would take these tests and they would come back and they'd say, you're very strange because it's like one <laughs> side, one side, which I am, but it's like one side of your brain is really technical. And the other side of your brain is very artsy, you know, it, it part yeah. of Myers Briggs. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Myers Briggs. Yeah. That's yeah. funny. Cause they said the same thing to me. Like you're a weirdo. And this is why there's like, yeah. here's why. That's why you and I are here. That's, yeah. <laughs> so, so I, I think, uh, but here's the interesting thing when, um, I, I have to feed, it's like, I have to feed both sides of my brain. So I have, yeah. to, so I have to do some technical stuff and then I have to do yeah. some artsy stuff. Yeah. And if, if I don't do both, then I, I, I kind of feel out of kilter. That's just kind of <laughs> how I'm wired. Yeah. So maybe much to the chagrin of some of my partners in at HWC engineering. I, I still do a little bit of work enough to get in their hair and aggravate them. Right. <laughs> Maybe. 
but mostly I do photography right now. I think it's awesome. It really is. So here we're, I'm sharing my screen. I want you to see the book. And if you're interested, then either from Jim or from me, we're happy to, to, uh, to send you the book. We have a gallery opening tomorrow. So if you're in Chicago, please come around five to 8 PM open to all. We'll probably have refreshments. Right. And we'll yes. tell more stories. Right. We'll make some yes. jokes. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I just can't thank you enough for joining us. Everyone who's been on the call and who's been here this entire time, or maybe just for a few minutes and buddy, I'm just thrilled to be sitting here next That's to you. Awesome to this is here. our second, like a conversation. Um, and it's big, heavy stuff, man. I mean, this is a really Jim, this is a really beautiful and brave and thank wonderful you. thing that you've done here. And I feel more connected to you, if that's even possible, as my brother from another mother. Right. I feel even more connected to you for learning the history and seeing your mother's face and learning about your family and learning uh, in, in some of this detail, although it's difficult to learn more about this because it's a lot of who you are and it's a lot about us as Midwesterners and Americans. Yeah. Yes, but let's not forget. This is a story from 60 years that started 60 years ago Yeah, when the ease of access to guns by the mentally ill was something that was very common. 60 years later, it's no better. It's no better. Really not a lot has okay. changed. And it's also a story about how art can help heal trauma, mm -hmm. but we're constantly trying to cut back on funding for art. And so... The, the, the two, some of the, the two salient points of this book, you know, right now in our culture, it's like, we're not paying attention. It's not just artistic. We're, we're it's topical. Attention. Yeah. I mean, this is That's a really right. relevant and, and topical um, subject. And again, it's, it is a very beautiful and moving book, no matter how deeply you decide to dive into the photographs or the prose, it's really, it's one of the, most amazing books that I've seen in a while. Um, and you, you look real good in that picture, man. We have this picture on our wall too. So you that, look good, that man. That's Craig Sumetko. Taken yeah. by Craig Sumetko. Yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. Mr. James Rice. So what else? We got more stuff cooking this spring. And so please um, join us. We're going to be uh, doing another Leica Academy this spring with uh, LA chef and Leica photographer, Jim Sullivan. Uh, who's going to uh, take us around and, and uh, show us how to uh, take pictures of, um, of uh, food and drink in the environment. He's going to talk about lighting. He's going to talk about all kinds of great stuff. Wonderful Leica Academy. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and we also have another Leica Academy coming up. That's with uh, Mark DePaula, which is uh, uh, Eyes Wide Open, right? I, is that what it's called? Something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, it's shooting wide open. That's what it is. He shoots a lot of stuff wide open. We're going to have him here on a Sunday, one day in uh, towards the end of March. Um, and we'll be sending out emails about that too. So if you've uh, heard from us about this topic, you'll hear from us about other ones as well. Um, and so if you've never done a like Academy, we urge you to do so. Um, not because we want to sell seats, but because it's a lot of fun. We just had a great time. We've done half a dozen academies oh, yeah. together yeah. and it's just, it's a lot of fun and we learn a lot. That's how we got to know Jesse. That's how we got to know Arthur Meyerson and Craig Semetko and all these people community. It's the most beautiful thing. So please join us. Here's a little contact information. Make sure you follow this man on Instagrizzle on Instagram. Um, <laughs> Because he's, he's great stuff and it's always good to be in touch um, for anyone who either doesn't use Instagram or is not really sure, please just email me or email the store or call us and we'll put uh, uh, everybody in uh, in touch. And let me see. I don't One know. One more thing. Yeah. 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 Don't forget. This is also a story about women in photography. My mother was a woman. That's and right. It wasn't easy uh, back in her day to be a woman in photography. It's not easy now. Um, there were a That's lot right. of women that helped me on this project. There are a lot of women that struggle uh, to be photographers and be recognized now. So don't forget, that's another important inclusion, topic. community. Buddy, thank you once again. 
Thank you. I'm just thrilled to be here thank with you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank great. you so much for attending, for being here with us. Thank you to Laika's, John and Matt, and everybody who helped make this evening such a fun conversation. Uh, buddy, I just can't congratulate you enough on your book. Please, please stay in touch. Don't be a stranger. If you're in Chicago, come and visit tomorrow night. Shake this man's hand. I'll sign a book for you. Um, and thank you. Thank you once again for attending our Leica conversation with Mr. James Rice. We'll be posting this on YouTube so that you can go and revisit and see some of the photographs and experience our conversation at your leisure. So thank you once again for joining us. I hope you all have a fabulous weekend. Get out there and make some pictures. And feel free uh, to uh, send us an email, give us a call. Don't be shy. We look forward to hearing from you again. Thanks again for being here.